Soon after the German invasion of Yugoslavia, two major resistance movements emerge. They both fight for the restoration of Yugoslavia, but both have very different ideas on what that should look like. The multi-ethnic communist partisans under command of Josip Broz Tito rival the Serbian Chetniks, leading to a political and military whirlwind in Yugoslavia in 1941. I'm Spartacus Olsen. This is a World War II in real time special episode. After the invasion of Yugoslavia in April 1941, the kingdom is carved up by the four antagonists Germany, Italy, Hungary, and Bulgaria. What was one country is now divided into nine different territories. Large parts are occupied or annexed, such as Slovenia by Germany and Italy, parts of Serbia by Hungary and Macedonia by Bulgaria. The independent state of Croatia, NDH, becomes a German puppet. Throughout former Yugoslavia, new regimes crack down on different national and ethnic minorities. In Croatia, the Ustasha unleashes its draconian purges on the Serbs who are killed, deported, or forcibly converted en masse. Large droves of people in Croatia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, are pushed into the ranks of the resistance movements by the harsh conditions under the new occupiers. But it takes until Germany's invasion of the Soviet Union for the resistance to get into organized action. Just after the invasion, Yugoslav communists laid low, not wanting to antagonize the Germans on behalf of the Soviet Union, honoring the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. Directly on June 22nd, as Germany invades the Soviet Union in Operation Barbarossa, Croatian communists stage an uprising in Sizak. On July 7th, Josip Broz Tito starts a revolt on his own in Serbia. He is one of the prominent leaders of the partisan movement, a name derived from the National Liberation Partisans Detachments of Yugoslavia, an armed wing of the Communist Party. Tito was appointed General Secretary of the Illegal Communist Party of Yugoslavia back in 1939. In that capacity, he was already running an underground partisan movement long before the Nazis invaded Yugoslavia. Tito aims to unite all Yugoslav nations in the struggle, saying that the words national liberation struggle would be nothing but words and even deception if they did not mean together with the liberation of Yugoslavia, the liberation at the same time too of Croats, Slovenes, Serbs, Macedonians, Albanians, Muslims, and the rest. His partisan movement is swiftly joined by people from all of these nationalities, though in 1941 the majority come from Bosnia and Herzegovina, Montenegro, and Serbia. The uprising is quite successful. Germany, having its hands full with fighting the Soviets on the Eastern Front, has only left behind a small detachment of three divisions of second-rate troops to keep order. The partisans are hard to catch, operating from mountains and villages, and Tito's uprising spreads rapidly through Western Serbia. In September 1941, he establishes his headquarters in Uzice. In every village that the very mobile partisans' forces take, they set up an administration and logistical system. This method makes civilians in the regions who are not joining the militia stakeholders in the resistance, which the partisans double down on with grand propaganda campaigns. This grows into the so-called Usice Republic, the first liberated territory of World War II in Western Serbia. Indy will host a special episode on the Republic of Uzice when the partisans attempt to set up a fully functioning state with a large active community, postal and railway services, and education system, to not mention a weapons and ammunition factory. Other Yugoslavians joined the Chetnik movement, created from leftovers of the Royal Yugoslav Army by Serbian nationalists. Many of its soldiers are ex-military who have fled to the mountains shortly after the German victory. Their most prominent leader is Draza Mihalovic, who enjoys support from the Serbian government in exile in London. The Chetniks' primary goals are to create a Serbian ethnic state in a Yugoslav monarchy. To many Chetniks, this carries with it a will to purge Serbia and Bosnia and Herzegovina of Croats, Muslims, and Jews. Nonetheless, they initially joined the partisans' uprising, abiding by the credo, one country, two masters. 
However, the Chetniks are scattered throughout the many Serbian villages, whereas the partisan movement is centered around the Communist Party and its leaders. The Chetniks' main operation centers are their villages, while the partisans bound to ideology rather than geography are more mobile and flexible. The lack of central organization makes it hard to pinpoint the Chetniks on the ideological scale. Some openly advocate collaborating with the Germans and Italians to build the Serbian nation within the Axis framework. Others are fanatically anti-German and advocate to join the partisans, while others are fiercely anti-partisan. Both the differences in ideological goals and operational organization makes a hard split between the partisans and Chetniks seem unavoidable. In any case, many Yugoslavs were driven to join the resistance movements as a reaction to Axis violence. Like in October 1941, when German Führer Adolf Hitler orders the shooting of 100 Serbs for every German soldier killed and 50 for every German wounded. For every such new retaliatory action by the Germans, Italians, Bulgarians, or Ustasha Croats, the partisan movements grows. This becomes part of Tito's deliberate strategy. His forces ambush German strongpoints with sometimes reckless hit-and-run guerrilla tactics, triggering Axis reprisals, which only increase the support for the resistance. The recklessness leads to direct civilian deaths, and compounded by the reprisals, this concerns some of the Chetniks. Their war goal is the survival of the Serbian nation, not the defeat of the Nazi regime or the establishment of a multi-ethnic communist state. They don't necessarily care about the clash of ideologies in the same way the communists do. The order to shoot 100 Serbs for every German results in the Kraljevo massacre on October 20th, where roughly 2,000 Serbs are killed. Another one follows in Kragujevac, where 2,324 are killed for a partisan attack on Milanovic. Retaliatory actions like that result in the death of 25,000 Serbs between October and December 1941 alone. The Chetniks now become increasingly reluctant to provoke any anti-Serbian actions from the Germans. So instead of active resistance, more and more Chetniks start to engage in passive resistance, or even passive collaboration. A German representative in Serbia writes five months into the occupation of Yugoslavia that there had been no battles between German forces and Chetniks to date. Although I should note that other accounts show Chetniks resisting alongside the partisans. The shift from resistance to collaboration is voiced in multiple groups within the Serbian nation. On August 13, 1941, a large group of 545 Serbs, including bishops, archpriests, 81 professors, generals, former ministers, directors, and journalists, published an appeal to the Serbian nation in major Belgrade papers, saying, In these fateful hours, it is the duty of each Serb, each true patriot, to help the country preserve peace and order with all his might. A handful of alien mercenaries and saboteurs under the command of criminal Bolsheviks senselessly jeopardizes all efforts to settle our situation. The duty of each true Serbian patriot is to thwart the infernal intentions of the communist criminals with all his might. Therefore, we call upon the entire Serbian nation to assist our authorities in the struggle against these enemies of the Serbian nation and its future by acting decisively in every situation using all available means. The Germans respond by installing a government in Serbia under leadership of one of the signatories, General Milan Nedic, who is now in charge of building up pro-Nazi forces in Serbia. In late September, Chetnik leader Kosta Pechanak openly aligns himself with Nedic's collaborationist government. By the autumn of 1941, Draža Mihailović also turns on the partisans. Sharing a common enemy with the Germans, Mihailović becomes increasingly friendly with Nedic and the Nazis. Though the Chetniks are still somewhat of a wild card and carry out the odd act of resistance against the occupiers, their forces are now also dedicated to the anti-communist fight against the partisans. All bridges are burnt by November 25th, 1941, when Mihailovic Chetniks join German and Serbian forces in their attack on the town of Uzice, the headquarters of Tito's Republic and partisan movement. This 
effectively ends the cooperation between the partisans and Chetniks, and it puts an end to partisan resistance in Serbia for now. That's far from the end of Yugoslav resistance, though. As I said, their success is not dependent on geography, but on ideology. And Tito moves his partisans into Ustasha held Bosnia. Partisans under the leadership of Tito will continue their fight, attracting more and more fighters fleeing ethnic persecution and seeking freedom from the Nazi occupation. You can Check out our special on how Polish resistance was stuck between communism and Nazism in 1940 in a very different way right here. Join our fight to bring the past back to life so that we can learn from our ancestors' mistakes and build on their achievements by joining the Time Goes to Army on Patreon.com or TimeGhost.tv. Never forget.